Welcome to the Aiken Unitarian Universalist Church Flower Communion Celebration. Welcome also to our friends and members who are joining us on the live YouTube stream channel. Hi guys. Annie Dillard has written, we are here to abet creation and to witness to it, to notice each other's beautiful faces and complex natures so that creation need not play to an empty house. So we begin this morning with a story about flowers and faces and a song of welcome. I first met the Reverend Mary Gregolia, a beautiful UU minister and songwriter, storyteller, singer at the General Assembly in Rochester, New York. Later, when I discovered she was ministering to the Eno River UU congregation in North Carolina, we invited her to offer a worship service to our brand new Aiken Unitarian Universalist congregation, which was then meeting in a child care center on the south side of Aiken, where it was redolent with the smells of the children's activities from the preceding week. But it was great to have a place. Mary was amazing, of course, and she told us this story. She said that she had gone through a period in her life when she felt like the walls were collapsing and she became extremely depressed. She lost her, her faith and hope and a friend said, I have a beautiful cabin out in the mountains. You go, you spend the winter there. All I ask of you is that every day you walk down and check the mail. There's a two mile walk down to the mailbox. And she said yes. She, she brought her guitar and her paper and her heart and soul and went to this cabin in the woods. And each morning she would walk, sometimes through mud, sometimes through snow, sometimes through ice, sometimes through blah, sometimes through sunshine, down to the mailbox to retrieve the mail. And this went on for several months. And one morning, about halfway there, all of a sudden, in front of her face was a flower. It was like that flower had been watching her back and forth and decided, now is the time to announce myself. She looked at that flower and she said, oh, yes. And then she said, oh, that's about me. So she said to the flower, thank you. And then she said, that's still about me. So she said, hello. And being a singer-songwriter, she made up a song about it. And we're going to use this song to greet each other this morning. We're going to sing it through at least five times, more if it feels right. And I would like you to look at the flower person next to you, absorb their beautiful face and complex nature, and sing this song to them. Um, and do this several times to the folks surrounding you so that everybody feels welcome. So the song goes like this. I will welcome our board member for the day. For all the faces I couldn't see, ah yes, ah yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hello, hello. Morning, I'm Bill Robinson. <clears throat> member of the Board of Trustees of Aiken Unitarian Universalist Church. 
where everyone is welcome to join us in support of spiritual growth, ethical living, and an open-minded exploration of religion. I know I've seen a few new faces this morning, so I don't know if you folks are here for the first time or not, but uh, if you'd like to tell us who you are, we'd like to extend you a welcome. Nobody wants to speak. Well, you're welcome anyway. You're returning. Okay. Well, I hadn't seen you before, but ah, yes, ah, yes. No. <laughs> Ah, good. Excellent. Oh, you're fine. Well, you brought a baby. You can come anytime with the baby. Yeah, you're fine. We were just talking about you, but we're glad you're here now. <laughs> You'll find announcements in our virtual bulletin board, the Chalice newsletter, and the weekly e blast. And there are also many Zoom opportunities for small group gatherings, sharing, and connections. Um, are there any flash announcements this morning? Nan. Coffee talks in two weeks. We have someone from Canada bringing our topic. And if anyone wants to be on Coffee Talks, it's a small group environment where we sit and chat. We can do it on Zoom, or if I come to the sanctuary in the early mornings on the first and third Sundays, we do it here. And it's at 9.30. So if anybody wants to be on the email, if you want to experience it, let me know and I'll put you there. And it's much fun. Diane did it today and it was all gaming, which was really different conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Nan. Anybody else? Yes, Mary. In fact, um, maybe you ought to come up. I, I'm not sure. Man, I, I don't know if everybody... Uh, coffee talks in two weeks uh, and a lot of other words. Hi. May 15th is our annual General Assembly meeting. And Membership Committee is planning on doing a potluck before... Uh, actually, no, during the, the meeting. And we should sure use some help. Um, we'd like you to see Mary C. in the back. Uh, you can see me. What we need is a, a potluck entree. That would be great. Uh, we also need a dessert. So those people who love desserts, bring, you know, let us know you're going to bring a dessert. We'd love some salad sides. That would be wonderful. Uh, just anything that you would, uh, and if you're not a cook, don't want to be a cook, don't plan on being a cook, bring iced tea, something like that, okay? So again, May 15th. We're going to have a good time at, during the meeting, but we certainly could use your help. Okay? Thank you. And I have one, too. Um, we have a great celebration in the history of this congregation coming up on May 28th. We are formally installing, installing our beloved minister. Um, and so the choir has to practice. So we're doing that at 9.15 next week and in two weeks after that. Um, so that we can get ready for the anthems and, and glorious music we want to give to her as a gift, um, Reverend Deborah Guthrie Joyce. And so there are no auditions for choir. If you like to sing, if you like to hear people laugh, please join us. We'd love to have you. Thank you. I've got two things as well. Um, I got a, uh, a notice on, from Security Federal on their website that they're experiencing a lot of fraudulent PayPal transactions and uh, wanted to, everyone to, to be cautious if you use PayPal. And I know a number of folks contribute to the church here uh, via that, that payment method. So uh, their advice is to check your account frequently and, and if there are any fraudulent transactions, why well, get a hold of whoever your financial carrier is. Uh, also, um, I'm happy to uh, give you an update on the pledge drive. The pledge drive doesn't actually end until, technically until tonight, but as of this morning, we have $112,000 um, pledged for next year. That's almost our goal, uh, but um, I, 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 I'm pretty sure we can, we can fit a budget in a number that's somewhere near there. If, um, if any of you uh, have yet to pledge, um, please do so today. The great and powerful Oz has spoken. <laughs> Finally, if you would uh, 
mute your, mute your phones and, and disconnect from the Wi-Fi here so that our broadcast wind bandwidth is better. Thank you very much. For those of you who may have been surprised by that brilliant um, personation, impersonation, the theme for our pledge drive has been um, the Wizard of Oz and following the yellow brick road and so forth. Thank you, Bill. Well, but he picks his moments. He does, he does. All right. Um, would you be willing to light our chalice this morning when I do the <laughs> so the reading this morning is from UU Minister Jacob Trapp. Simply to be and to let things be as they speak wordlessly from the mystery of what they are. Simply to say a silent yes to the hillside flowers, thank you for safety control, to the trees we walk under to pass from one person to another, a morsel of bread, and answering yes. This is the simplest, the most sacred of sacraments. Will you join me in singing Mother Spirit, Father Spirit? It's number eight in the gray hymnal, and you're gonna be hearing a lot about the person who wrote this hymn, Norbert Chopek, who created the Flower Communion service we're celebrating. Now this may not be familiar to you. Don't worry about wrong notes. Go ahead and read the words, get lost, find yourself again. We're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> Okay, um, we set aside some time in our gatherings to bring together not only our, who we are, but events of joys, sorrows, milestones in our lives that we know echo in the lives of others, to continue to build community with one another, to help each other open our hearts um, to our connections with each other. We call this our time of joys and sorrows. 
um, so that folks on the YouTube channel can hear and also so everyone else can hear. Debbie here has um, a handheld microphone. So if you would like to share this morning, I'll invite you to raise your hand and Debbie will come to you and you may share what is on your heart. And I'm going to step down and put in a stone for each one of the sharings to symbolize how we build community together. I'll welcome sharings. Just simply raise your hand. Um, a stone of healing for my wife. She's got kidney stones that she's trying to pass, so she's not feeling very good today. been gone for quite a while so we are very glad to be back and see all you guys but um, I just wanted to let you know that Tuesday I will finally graduate um, at 7 p.m. at the USC Convocation Center. Friends uh, Louise and John Plodnick are traveling uh, in Europe, and uh, Naomi and I were speaking this morning. I'm not sure exactly what the significance of Prague is, but they are in Prague. Okay. You will find out. Yeah, so stay tuned. This is my first time here, and I actually really do enjoy the community that you all have here. It's nice to see the amount of joy that's in this room. Well, thank you for being part of it. What is your name? Shannon. 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 Mm -hmm. Will you join me in just a moment of silence and then we'll sing a musical response to open our hearts to each other, the bird songs, the beautiful day, and the universe. Thank you. Do you have in your handed out programs a copy of a responsive reading? No. Okay. Then um, would you turn to number 723 in the gray hymnal and we will pray together. And I will read a statement and then I'll ask you to read the next one and then I'll read a statement and I'll ask you to read the next one and we'll read the final part together. Do you all have it in 723? Again, Norbert Chopek from Prague, more to come. In the name of Providence, which implants in the seed, the future of the flower, and in our hearts, 
the longing for people to live in harmony. In the name of the highest, In the name of sages and great religious leaders who sacrificed their lives to hasten the coming of the age of mutual respect. Together. In this holy resolve, May we be strengthened, knowing we are God's family, that one spirit, the spirit of love, unites us and endeavor for a more perfect and more joyful life. Amen. And in that spirit, if you'll turn in your gray hymnal, you can stay seated for this one to hymn number 396 from Mary Gregolia. I'll ask um, David, our magnificent pianist, to play it through once. If you feel moved to make a round out of it, go ahead and make a round out of it. This is a Unitarian Universalist church. And you are, um, you are to go where your conscience leads you. 396. I know this rose will open. We'll sing it through three times. Thank you, thank you. Hello, hello. Mary Gregolia, one of the great souls. And now we'll take a collection in support of this community. Um, if you don't have cash with you, take a moment while you hold the basket and send us your blessing and good wishes. Um, you can donate in other ways throughout the year. We rely on time and talent and energy as well as finances, although, as we know, those are essential. And um, we have volunteers to collect the offering. Thank you. Still the same, okay, as the needs grow with millions of refugees. Um, another piece of Prague and Czech history, at one time Czechoslovakia and the Ukraine were one country.
There is all kinds of history. So, what do you know about Czechoslovakia? Those of you like me of a certain age may remember the, um, the Prague Spring of 1968, pictures maybe on Time Magazine, or did they have a look in life then where there had been an, a flowering of freedom and, um, and reducing uh, repression and so forth in Czechoslovakia. And then the Russian Soviet, well, they were Soviet tanks at that time, came in and crushed it. They crushed it. And some people were assassinated and repression lasted again until the Berlin Wall was torn down and the Soviet Union broke into parts and there were changes, which we are still seeing the fruits of. I have been to Prague and I've been to Brno and the occasion was in 1991, 1992 with the Aiken Choral Society and the chamber singers. We went there and we sang the Dvorak Tadeum, which is a magnificent piece of music with the Prague Symphony Orchestra in their opera house. It was a great experience. It was just so wonderful, such a beautiful city. It's the Venice of Eastern Europe, although they've had floods since then and, and had to scramble like Venice is. But it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. At the time that I went, I had no idea about all the Unitarian Universalist ties to Czechoslovakia. With your permission, I'm gonna tell you about some of them. And they include our flower communion. Put on my glasses here. So the distance from Prague, the capital of what's now the Czech Republic, then was Czechoslovakia, to Kiev, the capital of Ukraine is about 850 miles. That's roughly the distance from New York to Atlanta. Think about that. And the distance from Kiev to Transylvania, to the city of Torda, where our first and only Unitarian King, John Sigismund, offered the first recorded religious freedom decree in Europe in the 1500s. That distance is 572 miles. That Transylvanian kingdom was surrounded by political religious pressure. There was a huge force from the Catholic armies that were coming in. There were Eastern Orthodox people who were clamoring for their religion to be acknowledged. There was the Protestant Reformation happening, Jan Hus and others coming through, um, continuing Martin Luther's call um, for more religious freedom in some ways. But the ally that preserved that Transylvanian kingdom and allowed for religious freedom was the Muslim Ottoman Empire, a radically Unitarian faith one God undivided. So this part of the world has seen historically many religious struggles as well as political struggles as well as wars and persecutions. And it's one of the birthplaces of our Unitarian Universalist faith. Here's another special Czech connection. Thomas Masaryk, the founder and first president of the New Republic of Czechoslovakia, before it was Czechoslovakia, before it was a republic, when it was part of the Austro-Hungary Empire, but was longing for its own space and existence, traveled to the United States to meet with President Woodrow Wilson to lobby for the formal creation of Czechoslovakia as part of the League of Nations Charter of 14 Principles, and they were one of the 14 principles. His wife, whom he had met while she was studying music in Leipzig, Charlotte Garriga, her family is a member of the Brooklyn Unitarian Church to this day. Norbert Chopek, about whom in a few more minutes, also worked with Masaryk to establish Czechoslovakia as a separate nation with free religious worship as a part of it. And both of them worked together to found what we now know as the IARF, the International Association for Religious Freedom which is our united faith project for every liberal wing of every religious re tradition that is. We have Buddhists from Japan, we have Catholics who were involved in Reformation, we have people from many Protestant faiths, from Hindu faiths, and so forth. 
The idea is freedom and progress. The IARF, they both worked for that. So with that background, I'm going to turn to some history and ask your indulgence. Those of you who are not history fans, you may sing a song in your head or look <laughs> at the flowers or whatever, because I think this is important. First, this day in Unitarian Universal Journalist history is a thing. There's actually a book. And on this day, among other things, May 1st, which is also traditionally celebrated as a spring flower day, right? The, U the Humanist Association's manifesto was published in 1933, signed by 36 prominent thinkers, among them scientists, philosophers, and academics, including seven Unitarian ministers and one Universalist minister. The manifesto affirmed 14 points of religious humanism and became a rallying cry for liberal religious thinkers. That's something to look up. In 1863, on this day, Mary Moody Emerson died in Concord, Massachusetts at the age of 88. She was the aunt of Ralph Waldo Emerson and is credited for being a huge influence on him. The, one of the founders of Transcendentalism and at one time a Unitarian minister. On the same day, in 1503, Caelus Segundus Curia was born in Piedmont, Italy to a distinguished family, studied for the Catholic priesthood, however, became influenced by Martin Luther and became persecuted for his challenges to the Trinitarian faith of the times, was arrested by the Inquisition three times, continued to escape, organized relief for civilian war victims of the Spanish siege of Milan, another one of our heroes. And in 1555 in Poland, the first synod of the Reformed Church in Poland opened at Pinkstow. The minor Reformed Church was Socinian in its doctrine. Another one of the free faiths, basically Unitarian, basically arguing for conscience of each individual person and a focus on community and justice in this lived world and working together to make things better, a paradise on the earth. So, now to Norbert Fabian Chopik, born June 3rd, 1870, died October 12th, 1942. Uh, he is the founder of the Flower Communion and so many other things, and a model for us today and for people also in Eastern Europe, I believe. I'm gonna read excerpts from his entry in the Bibliography Library of Unitarian and Universalists, which you can find online. Yes, it is a thing, a bibliography library. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entries. We have fabulous people. We had one um, person ask us early on in the life of this congregation, why are you always talking about Unitarian Universalists, right? Well, we don't talk a lot about dogma, right? And so we often try to remember to talk about our seven principles as well as living them. But we are a faith made by people by people who dedicated their lives to the principles that we honor, to the ethics that we try to live, to the moral recreation of our communities so that people can breathe and have enough to eat and roofs over their heads and medicine and peace. So these are our peeps and this library is full of them. I encourage you to look. So, Norbert Fabian Chopik a, Czechosla a Czechoslovak minister of extraordinary ability, after spending a few years in the United States, returned in 1921, this is after World War I now, to his native country to found and build in Prague, Czechoslovakia, what soon became the largest Unitarian church in the world. 3,200 members. It got so big, they had to buy a palace that covered two city blocks to house all of their programs. He established a vigorous new Unitarian movement across Eastern Europe. He was born in Bohemia in a small village, the only son of peasant folk. But his father, who was a tailor, was also a religious agnostic, a free thinker. His mother was a devout Catholic. He was a very idealistic child, and at 10, he became an acolyte in St. Martin's Catholic Church, but became disillusioned 
by cynicism, as he saw it, that probably wouldn't have been his 10-year-old word, and the behavior of the priest toward the parishioners. He had this urge for justice and equality. So at age 18, he resigned from the Roman Catholic Church and was baptized a Baptist, which was an active movement. The Anabaptists had their roots in the, um, the Brethren movements that became the Mennonites and um, the Moravians from that part of the world also. He became an apprentice to his uncle, also a tailor, in Vienna. And that shop supplied the House of Habsburg. So he had touch with the, um, the royals of the Austria-Hungary Empire. A chance encounter had led to his introduction to the Baptist way in religion. But he entered it with his whole heart and soon became a Bible distributor and a Baptist evangelist in Saxony and Moravia. He founded a dozen churches stretching from Ukraine to Budapest. While in Moravia, he edited several journals, one of which had a circulation of 80,000 at that time. But slowly, Chopik's faith became more liberal. And then he started doing research in the Moravian Library's archives at Brno, not too far from Prague, about 30 miles. And that research convinced him that a free Christian faith was native to his people, to Czechoslovakia this idea of conscience and questioning our seven principles. Though its history had was buried and forgotten, free Christianity had been very widely practiced for centuries before the coming of Roman Catholic minister, missionaries and subsequent state enforced Catholicism. In 1903, Chopik wrote Fragments from the History of Persecuted Christians, and in that paper he documented what he considered the Bohemian Moravian roots of the free faith that he himself was struggling to articulate. Some of you have been there, right? Struggling to articulate what it is that's true for you and the face of being told other things. He praised the religious convictions of the Moravian brethren who were anti-clerical, they did not have clerics. He said they valued the spiritual life above any teaching or dogmatics. Years later, in a 1921 letter to the president of the American Unitarian Association, Chopik described this paper as, quote, out and out Unitarian in conception and purpose. He had found a name. He had found a name for what he had come to believe. It was, in essence, the platform upon which he proposed to start a new religious movement in Bohemia, which is part of Czechoslovakia though he'd written it nearly 20 years earlier. Things take a while to bloom, like flowers from roots. As I said before, he played an important part in the founding of the International Religious Organization, now the International Association for Religious Freedom, the IARF, which was founded in the 1900s by Unitarians. At the 1910 Berlin IARF Congress, this was before World War I, Tomas Garig Masaryk, who later became, as I said, the first president of Czechoslovakia, was the one who introduced Norbert Chopik to the officers of the American Unitarian Association. Things weave together in amazing ways. He also then attended IARF con congresses, need a drink here in a minute, in London, Copenhagen, Boston, and Oxford. And he pushed the IARF to be more ambitious in organizing and recruiting than they were inclined to be. He was an evangelist. As the editor of various journals, he became quite outspoken in his criticisms of clerics. These criticisms caused the government to threaten him, and he was forced in 1914 to leave Bohemia, to leave Czechoslovakia. So he accepted a call to serve a Baptist church in New York City. And after a year in Manhattan, he moved to a larger congregation in Newark, New Jersey. But as he again continued his struggles in 1919, just after World War I ended, he left that ministry. He said, I just cannot be a Baptist anymore, even in compromise. Something wasn't working. The fire of new desires, new worlds is burning inside of me. And again, I think some of you have felt that fire in your soul. Chopik and his wife Maja joined the Unitarian Church in Orange, New Jersey in January 1921. 
Having been led there by their children's enthusiasm for the church's religious education program. Let's hear it for Kids RE. Now, he'd worked really hard during World War I to campaign to win U.S. public and governmental support for the independence of Czechoslovakia, just like Thomas Masaryk. And so, in 1921, with the establishment of Czechoslovakia, the family returned to their newly independent country home. They left their daughter Mila in the U.S., where she married a Czech-American businessman. And together, they began to build a vigorous nationwide religious movement. In just 20 years, which is the length of time this church has been meeting in this building, the Unitarian Church in Prague, with 8,200 members became the largest Unitarian congregation in the world. Some 8,000 Czechs considered themselves Unitarian. He created institutions based on his ideas about education. Nearly 300 kids and young people were enrolled in the church school. There was a school of religious science sponsored by the church that had 66 students in training for church leadership. Courses in religious history and philosophy written by Norbert Chopik were taught in Prague's public schools. This is how you can make things change. The Prague Church sponsored an extensive counseling program conducted jointly by Chopik and a medical doctor, offering, among other things, classes for expectant parents, marriage counseling, and conflict resolution courses, and counseling for those suffering the loss of a loved one Remember, this was the wake of World War I, with all its devastation. In other th newly thriving towns across the Republic, in Brno, in Pledzen, in Nimburg, Kladno, Lurny, and Rakovnik, he established six lay-led Unitarian mission stations, similar to Aiken UU fellowships, which this congregation once was. He visited these regularly until the day of his arrest. On the 28th of March, 1941, Chopik and his daughter Zora, age 29, were arrested by the Gestapo and taken to Pankrak prison. Zora was accused of listening to foreign broadcasts and distributing the content of some BBC transmissions. Czechoslovakia had already been taken over by the Reich, by the Third Reich. Chopek was accused also of listening to foreign broadcasts and of high treason. Several of his sermons were cited as evidence of the charge of treason. Listening to foreign broadcasts was a capital offense under the Nazi protectorate. Two separate trials were held, the first at Pancrack Prison soon after their arrest, the second an appeal of the original decision at Dresden in April 1942. The appeals court found Chopik innocent of treason, recommending that given his age, the year between his arrest and the appeals trial, that that be counted toward his jail time. However, the Gestapo, ignoring the court's recommendation, sent Chopik to Dachau concentration camp and his daughter Nora to forced labor in Germany. Chopek's name appears among prisoners sent on an invalid transport in October 12, 1942 to Hartheim Castle near Linz, Austria. He died of poison gas, but we know also that he was tortured by submission to the medical experiments that were ongoing in the Nazi concentration camp regimes. Of the half dozen books he authored, Chopik considered his book, Toward a Sunnier Shore, published in 1929, his most important work. On the eve of World War II in 1939, quote, at a time of great sadness for my nation, he published a second edition, wishing it might spread, quote, a few rays of sun to the wounds of the heart that he knew war would bring. Its essential message was that people can choose their own moods and direct their own feelings, and that they should, above all, try everything with humor. A recommended approach to life that bears, of course, a very strong resemblance 
to Viktor Frankl's logotherapy coming out of his experience in the concentration camps. Norbert Chopik celebrated, quote, the hidden cry for harmony with the infinite, deep in every soul. Each person, he wrote, is an embodiment of God. And in every one of us, God struggles for higher expression. Religion, he said, can never die because human beings cannot be but religious, regardless of the form of their religion. Religion should, before all else, provide that, quote, inner harmony, which is the precondition, precondition of strong character, good health, joyful moods, and a victorious creative life. It is my ideal, he wrote, that Unitarian religion in our country should mean a higher culture, new attitudes toward life, and practically a new race of people. In short, Unitarian religion should mean the next advanced cultural level for our people. The church's task, he felt, must be to place truth above any tradition, spirit above any scripture, freedom above any outside authority, and progress above all reaction. He defined religious education as an endeavor to awaken the inner forces of the child, to teach how to organize, harmonize, and adapt to the ever-changing influences which come from outside. His was a sun-drenched pre-Holocaust faith in the words of the biography, one that sustained thousands of his compatriots during the darkness of Nazi occupation in Czechoslovakia, 1939 to 1945. His faith enabled him to endure his own martyrdom with an equanimity and heroism confirmed by survivors who knew him in the concentration camp at Dachau. Small of stature, barely over five feet, Chopik was nonetheless acclaimed as one of the nation's leading orators. He wrote more than 90 hymns, often composing the music as well as the verses. We're singing several today. The flower communion is a ceremony he invented. In 1923, the church in Prague, which was beginning, and was then meeting in a building called Unitaria, which still has the, the marble word Unitaria over it in Prague. It was non-clerical. People came and they talked, very much like coffee talk. They didn't really sing. There wasn't the formal message at that time. It was an ingathering of community. And some people from the Roman Catholic faith um, said, we need more liturgy. And some people from the Protestant faith said, yes, but if you're going to do communion, everybody gets to participate. And other seekers had their opinions, and these other people had their opinions. And finally, he said, I don't know how to say this in, in Czechoslovakian. It would be yet in, Ger in Russian. He said, we're going to do something different. And so he created the flower of communion. He asked his people to each bring with them to the next church service a flower that had spoken to them. And these were put in one large vase. And the vase was like, it had to be like as big as the, almost the, the front four rows of chairs because we have pictures of them. They are huge, these flowers. And after the service, each person would be invited to approach the collection of flowers and choose a flower that smiled on them that was different from the one that they bought, symbolizing the beautiful diversity of all human beings, Symbolize, symbolizing the profound richness of diversity. A field of many different flowers calls many more honeybees than a single cultivar symbolizing our need for beauty and our need for each other. And we will conclude our flower communion a little bit later this morning, singing and inviting you to do the same. I would point out that if you didn't bring a flower, there are plenty. This is very much like the parable of the loaves and the fishes that Jesus taught. It began with a couple loaves of bread and three fishes and fed thousands. You're cool. Pick a flower 
And take one home if you feel moved to do so for somebody else who's not here with us this morning. So let us consecrate the flowers here. Let us bless them together. Would you read this consecration with me? It's number 724 in the hymnal. Again, it was written by Norbert Chopik. 724. The consecration of the flowers. Do you all have it? Okay. Infinite spirit of life. We ask thy blessing on these shy messengers of fellowship and love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and devotion to thy holy will. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship, of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish friendship as one of thy most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's talents discourage us or sully our relationship, but may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do thy work in this world. Thank you. We have blessed the flowers. Let us now sing another of Dorbert Chopik's hymns. Number 78, Color and Fragrance. Again, it has kind of a Czech sounding um, melody. Don't let that worry you. Sing what you can, enjoy it, and there are no wrong notes. Color and Fragrance. <laughs>
Some of these are from the roadside as they would have been in that time. Some are from gardens and we still have more. So take more home if you would like at the end of the service. Thank you all for your giving. We extinguish our chalice with reading number 456 in the back of the hymnal. Would you be willing to extinguish it too? Let's see. You, you may need to blow it out if the little thing is there. Okay. This is our traditional closing. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And I'm going to read a benediction from hymn number 28, also a hymn from Norbert Chopik. You may wish to read along. It seems so appropriate in this time of knowing what is going on in Ukraine and other places around the world, in Yemen, in Syria, in the Congo, everywhere where people are struggling, where people are frightened, where people are in need. He wrote this while he was in Dachau, and it was smuggled out and saved. View the starry realm of heaven, shining distant empires sing. Sky song of celestial children turns each winter into spring, turns each winter into spring. Great you are beyond conception, God of gods and God of stars. My soul soars with your perception. I escape from prison bars. I escape from prison bars. You, the one within all forming in my heart and mind and breath. You, my guide through hate's fierce storming. Courage in both life and death. Courage in both life and death. Life is yours. In you, I grow tall. Seed will come to fruit, I know. Trust that after winter's snowfall, walls will melt and truth will flow. Walls will melt and truth will flow. Amen and blessed be. Go in peace, return in love. Linger, if you will, for community, for conversation, for wonderful refreshments. Thank you for coming. And please come again soon. Bring friends. Let's have a thousand people in Aiken. Take care.